Alex here with part 67 of the My Docket series on child custody and visitation. As with my previous videos, I'd like to take this opportunity to direct my viewers to part zero. If you haven't seen it yet, that's the video that contains a detailed disclaimer and the underlying purpose of the series. Two things that I will glaze over are, number one, I am not in the middle of this right now. My case is completely and totally over. It's closed. It cannot be reopened. And that's because my ex's parental rights have been terminated. Number two, the nutshell version as to the purpose of the series is that I want to provide my viewers with one big example of my eight-year-long high-conflict child custody ordeal from beginning to end in chronological order. So this is my first appellate loss, and I do recall being extremely frustrated by it. And I was frustrated by it because I didn't understand how the law worked. I assumed that because a lot of the law seems to be logically put together, the decisions are also going to be done in a logical fashion, but more so, and they are logical, but it's like, I thought it was going to be more so abstract, um, kind of looking at the case from what made the most sense, kind of um, uh, replacing the decision my judge made with the decision that they thought would be the best decision. And I explained why none of this is the right way to approach a legal system. I figured this out way later, but at the time I remember being really frustrated. In fact, the, the reasons behind um, my video of the machine and um, fairness versus the law is to sort of explain this to my viewers. This, the, the legal system, it does try to be logical. They do put together precedent in a way that is logical, but not, not sort of from a, a first-hand review of a case. They are bound by the statutes that were enacted by the legislature, the court rules that were enacted by the judiciary, and they do very strictly adhere to, at least in Nevada, they very strictly adhere to the standard of review. In fact, that's another video that I've done a topic on. And so you are going to see logic in the decision of the higher court, but it's going to be through those lenses. It's not going to just be sort of, let's take a look at this case and see what we, we would have done. So now that I understand that, I actually do agree with the decision I do think that most of the blame falls into the lap of the legislature. I do think some of the blame falls into the lap of my, my lower court judge. But as far as I'm concerned, the Supreme Court's decision does make sense to me. And of course, knowing that now, had I known that then, I wouldn't have filed the appeal at all. Or I would have waited until I had a more egregious set of circumstances that I could have presented to them. In fact, some of the irony here is that the decision or the, the type of actions that my ex would have had to commit, which she does eventually commit later on, and I do eventually get relief later on. I get her banned from going to any of these appointments completely. Um, and that's kind of what I was going to lead into. The type of stuff that I would have needed to really force the judge to do this is the same type of stuff that would have not really just caused the delegation of legal custody rights between the two of us, but completely resulted in the deprivation of all of her legal custody rights. In other words, the type of stuff that would have forced the court to take action wouldn't have forced the, the court to split it up between us. It would have forced the court to give it all to me. And that does eventually happen in the case. Number one, I do get sole legal custody. And number two, I do get an order banning her from going to any of these appointments. But those things come later on. And I still stand by what I said earlier. Had the court taken the action that I requested and split up the legal custody rights as I asked, some of those other more severe actions would have probably never happened. So even though the judge in this court did, I mean, what he was allowed to do under the law, and even though the Supreme Court upheld his decision as their standard of review required them to do, all of those things, while legally sound, led to the terrible conclusion that her parental rights had to be terminated. So sometimes the law doesn't match up with reality. And when that happens, that really is a red flag that the legislature needs to step up to the plate and enact the necessary statutes to force these cases to go in the right direction. I think that the legislature should deal with high conflict child custody more aggressively. And I think they should fashion statutes that force the judges to take the necessary actions rather than leaving the judges um, discretion to figure it out on their own. I don't think that's fair to the judges. I think that the reason it's not fair is because so much of high conflict child custody requires counterintuitive approaches to very complex problems. What I mean by that is 
the solution that appears to be the obvious solution is the wrong solution. And that's not something that you see all over the place. In fact, most of the time, the solution that seems to make sense is the correct solution. But with high conflict child custody, and this isn't just me that's saying this, if you take a look at Dr. Steve Miller's YouTube videos, his testimony before Congress, he explains this, he underlines it, he, he circles it in red. You are going to make mistakes if you don't know the dynamics of how this works. So anyway, at this point, we should just go ahead and take a look at what the Supreme Court has filed. Here we have the Supreme Court of Nevada's Order of Affirmance. An order affirming a decision is an order that upholds the decision. In other words, they are not going to intervene and disturb that lower court's decision. They are explaining why it was correct, and let's just go straight into it. First paragraph is a standard summary paragraph. The Supreme Court is indicating that the appeal was filed by a non-attorney. That's what they mean by proper person appeal and that it is involving child custody. They also, from what I've always seen, um, point out the lower court, not just the district, which in this case is the second judicial district, but also the division, and the name of the judge who filed the order in the lower court. In this case, it's Chuck Weller. Going into the next paragraph, we can go ahead now and find out their reasoning. Right away, I can tell that they used the abuse of discretion standard, which means unless you show that the, somehow the lower court abuses discretion, they're not going to intervene. What this means, you can go into full-blown essays on what this standard is. There are all sorts of ways in which they can find that the, the court abuses discretion. One of them is that the court just made an arbitrary decision, which means they didn't really apply any logic. They just kind of, uh, you could say maybe a judge who decided Rather than getting into the details of the case, they're just going to give half to one side and half to the other. That could be um, an arbitrary decision because the judge didn't actually look at anything. They just decided, you two can't agree, so let's pick something in the middle. The other is a capricious decision. That might be something where the judge makes a decision against one party for reasons that have nothing to do with the case. Maybe they just don't like that they were disrespected or something like that. Uh, maybe they don't like that this particular person didn't take an agreement or a settlement offer, and for that reason they want to punish them. These are things that have nothing to do with the case. They could be considered a capricious decision. There's also decisions where a judge just decided not to follow the law for no reason that makes any sense at all. Um, there are some oddball situations where a law can be ignored, such as constitutional issues, but for the most part, the law has to be followed, and if they can't explain why it doesn't, that's another way to abuse their discretion. But I think most of the decisions, and this is the one that's gonna, well, my, my particular appeal is gonna fall into this category. Most of the decisions fall into an area of the law where a judge didn't necessarily break any laws by making the decision, but at the same time, there were other opportunities, other available decisions that they could have made that also wouldn't have broken the law. In other words, um, this particular area of the law may have 10, 15, 20 different right decisions, and um, who's to say that yours is any, or the one that you proposed is any better than the one that the judge actually chose? And that's where the abuse of discretion standard comes into play. And it's really difficult to get them to actually hold that a judge abuse their discretion. In this particular situation, I'm asking the judge to do something that he doesn't necessarily have to do under the law. And as long as he has some plausible explanation, oftentimes they will uphold the decision. It's very difficult to get a judge's decision overturned where they have discretion or wide latitude. In fact, I've dedicated an entire video to the problem of discretion, and this is no different. I don't really blame the Supreme Court for this. More so, I blame the legislature. The legislature has created these statutes, and they decide where the judges are going to have leeway, and when they decide to give a judge leeway, um, in many ways, it's the legislature that is to blame for judges not really understanding what is probably best for the children there. I think a lot of times the legislature just kind of kicks the can into the judiciary's ballpark and they just kind of throw their hands up and say, eh, you guys can figure it out. You guys are smart. 
And a lot of these areas in child custody, especially high conflict child custody, are counterintuitive. And counterintuitive areas are going to invite error. And it might not necessarily be a legal error, but it's going to be something that hurts the child. I do think that the legislature can do more here to outline precisely when solutions like this are appropriate. And in this particular case, I'm talking about the solution of giving one of us legal custody rights regarding medical and one of us legal custody rights regarding educational. But I can't say I fully disagree with the decision. Um, even in this next line here, the Supreme Court indicates that the child custody decisions that are made will not be overturned unless there's an abuse of discretion. And that unless a substantial change in circumstances can be shown to affect the child's best interests, they're not going to intervene and force the judge to modify. I think that the next case that they cite, which is Mosley Figliuzzi, provides the most insight into the way that the Supreme Court is going to approach a problem like this. And that is that evidence of bickering an uncooperative parent in and of itself without demonstrating an adverse effect on the child doesn't warrant modification. So is there more that I could have done to really force this to come into play? The answer is yes, but what I would have had to do is not just allege that we can't get along. I would have had to allege that the inability for us to get along is actually affecting his welfare. And I don't recall mentioning that. I do recall mentioning that it, it, it was a, a tough situation at these appointments, that she would you know pull stunts, that, th that, that things were, the situation was uncomfortable or tense, but I really didn't bring up anything that could force the court into taking action. I really didn't show, like for example, if I would have waited until the dental appointment where she stepped into the surgery room, and that, of course, caused the, uh, the surgery to become aborted, the oral surgery to become aborted. Something like that could indicate that there is uncooperative parenting, but it's affecting the welfare of our son. So at this, at this point in time, I can't say that there's just so much wiggle room. It's such a big gray area as to the court's approach to the problem that it's hard to say that for sure the Supreme Court messed up, and it's hard to say that for sure that the judge messed up. What I can say is that if you don't consider the law, if you just sort of consider the practicality of the situation or where the, where the case ends up going, if you just look at those things, those things that are outside the boundaries of the law, it's obvious that this was a mistake. And that's because in the end, the court's failure to act and the Supreme Court's failure to intervene have led to the termination of my excess parental rights because she just... She just couldn't stop, and it did continue to get worse and worse and worse. And a decision like this, with absolute certainty, would have prevented the loss of her, at least the loss of her legal custody rights, and maybe that would have present, uh, prevented the loss of some of her other custodial rights, including the termination of her, of her parental rights. And that's just because there would not have been an opportunity for there to be conflict. When you remove the opportunity for conflict with a high conflict party, you end up solving a lot of the problems. And the law doesn't really understand this because the statutes that have been fashioned by the legislature weren't fashioned in a way that really creates this as an issue for the judges. The judges do see, I think there's one of the best interest factors that talks about the conflict between the parents, but the judges don't really understand the mental health dynamic and how it sort of intersects with high conflict child custody. I think sometimes the judges just see high conflict child custody as two parents who can't agree and who bicker. I don't think that they understand that one of the parents has a severe emotional mental health issue. Um, actually, I kind of blob that together. I don't think they understand that a high conflict parent either has a, so, uh, a severe emotional immaturity issue or or uh, mental health issues up to and including personality disorders. And without them really understanding that this is a thing and that this is a really good solution to that problem, they're not really going to understand how to deal with it legally. So I want to go ahead and stress that I do believe that this decision should have been granted by the lower court. It would have been good for the Supreme Court to uphold, or sorry, to intervene and reverse his decision. But at the same time, based on the laws as they're written, I can see why they didn't. And this is just going to be one of the challenges for our legislature. I do hope that one day in the future, four or five, ten years from now, that the legislatures of all 50 states start to see that this is a problem that needs to be tackled more aggressively. And that leaving wide open doors for the judges to sort of figure it out on their own is not only sort of a dereliction of their duty to act, you know, as a, as a professional legislature, as a competent legislature, but it's also unfair to the judges. The judges really need guidance in these areas where the solution to the problem is counterintuitive. I can't stress this enough. There are a lot of areas where the solution is, for the most part, common sense. You can kind of see it and make the decision. But in high conflict child custody, there are a lot of decisions where... 
the solution is counterintuitive. And unless they see this problem over and over again and have extensive training, they're not going to understand how to solve the problem. And in the end, it didn't just hurt the judiciary and it didn't just hurt our son. It also ended up hurting my ex because, as I mentioned, these types of decisions being allowed to stand just cause her to get worse and worse and worse and then lead to the terrible conclusion of a termination of parental rights. So it's unfortunate that, you, that these, this decision isn't a little bit um, more in depth, but at the same time, uh, there isn't really much more to say about it. I think with the last case that the Supreme Court cited, they have stated enough. And uh, I hope that people take that statement from them and kind of use it in other areas of high conflict child custody. In my particular situation, it got in my way and it prevented the court from intervening. But I think in other types of cases, uh, that, that particular case citation might actually help some people who are sort of on the defensive and who are facing allegations that um, they are the high conflict parent. Okay, so let's take a look at the next document. The remitter. This is sort of like a receipt, I guess you could say, that they send back to the lower court to let them know that they are done with the case. And this little piece of paper is actually, it has a whole lot of power behind it, even though it's a one page, or it's a two page, I guess. There's a certificate from the clerk. Okay, so even though it's a very short document, it matters tremendously because it gives the jurisdiction back to the lower court. Until the remitter is sent back to the lower court, the lower court does not have the jurisdiction to make decisions in this particular area that's on appeal. So this is a very important document and uh, don't take it lightly. I also wanna mention that the remitter typically does not issue right away. You can get it to issue early, it's very rarely done. Typically both parties have to agree. But for the most part, it takes about 30 days. I believe all 50 states are probably in that ballpark of 30 days. And it does allow for certain issues to be resolved before the case is handed back to the lower court. So sometimes that can involve costs. Somebody might want a, an award of costs. Sometimes attorney fees. Uh, sometimes somebody might want to um, file a, a, a post-judgment motion of some sort to kind of have an issue looked at again. And there are two or three different types. There's a ways to have the full bench of the Supreme Court look at this decision. In this particular situation, it was just a panel, so just three judges. But you could ask for all seven by petitioning for in-bank reconsideration. You could ask for rehearing on a particular issue if you want to point out that you think they made a mistake. And then now that we have a Court of Appeals, you can ask for review by the Supreme Court if the Court of Appeals is the court that made the mistake, that you believe made the mistake. So um, I think at this point, we can take a look at the next page, which is the clerk's certificate and judgment. I believe that this just gives, see, there's a seal right here. Um, so the original copy that the lower court gets must have a raised seal, and it just makes it so that this document being transmitted to the lower court is seen as an official and certified um, remitter, or you know, the document that is the end of the case. A few things that I wanna to mention to my viewers are, if you haven't seen it yet, please watch my video, Jurisdiction Divested on Appeal. And you could also take a look at, there's another video I have, I think uh, for post-judgment papers that can be filed in a Supreme Court, in the Supreme Court of Nevada or in the Court of Appeals. I don't remember what the title was, but it might be under something like petitions for rehearing or petitions for in-bank reconsideration. I might have multiple different videos on that. You can take a look at that to learn a little bit more about how you can challenge an order of affirmance. And um, just, I'm gonna talk about that later because I do end up filing one at least one time, I believe. So I'm gonna hold off on that until I get to that point in my docket series. Going into the aftermath, I filed no documents, so I didn't incur any costs. My ex's attorney didn't file any documents either, so she didn't incur any costs either. I didn't have an attorney, so I incurred zero dollars in attorney fees. My ex's attorney would have probably spent no time at all reviewing the remitter. I don't think she would care to. The order of affirmance, maybe she would have glanced over it, maybe like a minute just to see that she didn't have to deal with anything in the lower court because the decision was upheld. And maybe like four minutes to pick up the phone, call my ex, she probably wouldn't have even called her. She would probably just sent her an email with like a PDF link showing her that the decision was upheld. So let's go ahead, I mean, five minutes. Uh, let's, let's kind of round it up to 15. Uh, I think that's not unreasonable for review of a Supreme Court decision and some really quick communications to my ex. 15 minutes is a quarter of an hour at the rate of $250 an hour. That's going to come to $62.50 in attorney fees for my ex. As with my previous videos, if you have any questions, feel free to post them down in the comments below, and I will see you guys next time.